right, so uh, today, I, I mean, this isn't really a conclusive thing. I'm still working on it. Uh, so today I'm just looking for feedback. Uh, this is the pretty much the premise to my next book. It's called An Alien Named Jesus. So if any of you guys are, in, are interested in that name. Uh, so in the book, I talk about morbid curiosity and how that relates to our belief in God. And I also tie it into aliens, too, and then attempt to prove that God is an alien. Uh, but for this, for the sake of this presentation, I'm just going to keep it short and stick it to morbid curiosity and God. And this is why we love to scream. All right. So uh, the first thing that I want to talk about is the macabre. Uh, and the definition of macabre is right here. But uh, in short, it's it's really what is repulsive. It's really the grim, the grotesque, the gruesome. It's that really nasty stuff. Like, why are we drawn to something that's so repulsive? It seems like it doesn't make any sense. Uh, we're attracted to celebrity scandals, uh, car chases, car crashes. You know, we always giraffe neck out when we see a cop or like three cops pulling over one dude. We always look out. We want to see what's going on. Uh, and we like disturbing things because we like to scream. And scream is an acronym for strength, catharsis, reality, exploration, acceptance, and meaning. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm just gonna go over here point by point and uh, demonstrate how I think. Well, first I'm gonna explain how it relates to morbid curiosity, and then I'm gonna explain how it relates to a god. All right, so strength. All right, so whenever we look at something gruesome, whenever we watch a, a horror movie or something of that nature, something bloody, anything, anything thriller-esque, whenever we look at that kind of stuff, it can make us actually feel stronger. There was actually a study at Duke University that showed after being shown a bunch of gruesome images, people often left feeling stronger, that they that they saw something scary and they made it through. They conquered it. It was like a, a hurdle. So the reason why that makes sense is because of something called the boomerang effect. Have you ever told a kid to not press the button or not open a box or something? What do they want to do? They, they, they want to do whatever it is you just told them not to do. Uh, so a great example of the boomerang effect is actually there was a you guys know who Barbara Streisand is, right? All right, obviously. Uh, Mecca Streisand, that whole that whole shenanigan. Uh, so there was a, a Google Earth thing, and one of and her her house was in one of the pictures. Uh, she complained about that, and b before before she went to court about it, uh, only six people have downloaded the picture, and two of them were her lawyers. After the, after the court case, that picture went viral, and there were over a quarter of a million downloads on that picture. So the more we try to suppress something, the more it seems to boomerang back. And as I explained before, repulsiveness makes us feel stronger. We, we leave feeling like we have conquered something, and it can, it can make us feel better because the made-up fictions help us cope with the real ones. All right. So when we're talking about history, and I know, you know, you know, Sean, Rob, all you guys, you guys love history. Uh, I think it's okay. So, so what did people used to do before we had the scientific method and all of modern science? People used to cast spells and do that crazy kind of stuff. They used to offer sacrifices, and these are the kind of actions that would maybe help you feel stronger. I mean, what do we have now? We have people praying a lot. They have, they think they have some sort of control over God's will or God's plan. And more importantly, they think they can change the outcome of something that cannot, that they cannot possibly have any control over. So can you imagine how strong that would feel to have something that, that you thought controlled all these things that you cannot otherwise control? It's truly a strong idea. It's not actually strong, but it's a strong idea. All right, so catharsis. Uh, catharsis is what we feel when one of our friends is in pain or something like that. Uh, <laughs> so, For people that feel. 
Yes, for people that feel. Thank you. Those guys. <laughs> All right. So while watching a movie, we can view scenes of anger, aggression, violence, all that kind of stuff. And in a way, it can help us vent. We can. That's why playing violent video games gives us an outlet. Uh, so that's that's pretty much the basis of catharsis. It's a way. It's not exactly empathy, but it is just a way to relieve pressure from yourself. And these, this is this just proves my point. These are some of the top most grossing movies uh, released in recent years, except for this one, 1971. That's a long time ago for me, I guess. Uh, these are the number of kills. These are the number of deaths on screen. And some of these are so popular. Lord of the Rings, 300, Troy. Like these are some huge movies, and we seem to really enjoy the macabre. And come on, guys. Have you watched Passion of the Christ? Yeah. I think like actually a total ten minutes of that is maybe not bloody. I'm pretty sure that was the actual number. Alright, so creating scenes of death and suffering that play with our emotions is like grasping at low-hanging fruit. It's, it's a task beneath such logical creatures as ourselves, or does it show us that we have a leash, some sort of control over our emotions? Does it give us uh, a way of releasing these feelings that we cannot otherwise release? Alright, so what does catharsis have to do with gods? Uh, so there are two main points, and th these are pretty much the most important ones when it comes to the philosophy of catharsis. Uh, Aristotle pointed out, I think it was Aristotle, uh, he pointed out that it was pity and fear. These are two very important things, but fear is the most important. Alright, so how many of you guys have heard of the concept of hell? Mm. Mm, yes, alright, alright. Uh, so, this is definitely a fear that plays into a lot of things. That's why we have such things as Pascal's Wager, to scare us into believing. Uh, what if there is a hell? What if we're going to it? These, these are things that, even though we're much smarter people, we can still entertain the question. Right? Uh, and, I mean, religions have exploited fears for so long. Pretty much since the start of religion, we have exploited people's fears. And this is my favorite fear, uh, especially since it's biblical. Uh, the fear of God. We're supposed to fear something that is all loving. What kind of... This sounds something very cathartic. It sounds like God or we are the cathartic agents of God. So, as in, uh, God maybe feels pity for us, that he doesn't want to send us to hell. All this uh, shows into some, some relation with God. Some, I mean, that's the whole image of God thing, right? Some relation with God that can make us feel a little better. Like, God, an almighty, powerful being, cares about us. Alright, so fear of God, we, we've covered that, that's cathartic fear, all merciful, God feels pity for us. And then God, in this case, and I said it wrong before because I'm an idiot, uh, is the cathartic agent for us. Next is reality. So there's this guy, uh, Eugene Louis Doyon, and he cut up corpses into stackable slices. And there are way more, this is probably like the least gruesome one I could find out of all of his pictures. Uh, he cut up these corpses and then kind of folded them, he stacked them like meats. Uh, why, like, are any of you guys just interested in looking at this? Yes, Chris. Like, is this interesting? <laughs> if, if you saw this in real life, would you kind of stare at it, kind of wonder what's going on? I might hold no, pieces no, down and take I a would. look as long as they don't it, smell bad. There you go, that's fine, that's good enough. I, I would totally I like body work, world, or whatever that was. Right. That, that, Wasn't that at the museum or something? Same thing, yeah, yeah that's really cool. They cut off bodies. Okay, that's I think pretty it's cool. awesome. Yeah. I didn't even hear about that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the importance about this is it served as a testament and a wonderful reminder to what we really are inside. Guts. We're just yeah, we're guts and bones and this disgusting thing that you can just cut up like a normal ass meat. Alright, so this one is one of my favorite stories. Uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh. You guys know that one, right? Alright, good. So there's a story in the Epic of Gilgamesh where the townspeople are warned that it will soon rain 
kiptu and cuckoo, uh, the words for corn and the word and the sound corn makes when falling on the ground. Uh, but in the story, those words were actually puns for. Uh, I forgot what they were. Oh, for misery and suffering. That's, that's what it was. They were actually puns for misery and suffering. The people who got the pun, they boarded up their doors, they prepared for a flood. Uh, and the people who didn't, perished. And now that's the one, the one story where, in mythology, or not the one, I'm not, I don't know all of them, but that's one of the stories in mythology that seems to promote rational thought over... I guess being a fucking idiot. Uh, so, and it's really strange that in our society today we have, uh, you, know, you know, being a skeptic is looked down upon for some weird ass reason. All right. So, more in reality, how do some Christians describe how they know God to be real? Can anyone answer this? They just know. They, they, uh, they just know. Kind, kind of like feeling it, right? Experience. More specifically, personal revelation from God. Right. So, a revelation or a vision can make us feel a bit euphoric. You know, it's that feeling like, wow, we have just experienced something real. Like, we, we get those feelings all the time, because we're humans and we're susceptible to that kind of bullshit, where, you know, we feel an enormous amount of pain, we feel the blood rushing, we feel our body is just changing temperature, uh, and it makes us feel somewhat real. It is that sense of reality. So, a personal revelation from God, even if you're delusional, can still make you feel like you're experiencing something truly real. Exploration. So, uh, all the Mythicist members, mm -hmm. do you guys know who Hanu is? Other than the fact that it says it right here. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so he's the world's first explorer. First one. Uh, and the, He's like a little bit before uh, Gilgamesh. Uh, so, he opened up the, trans, uh, the, the trade routes for uh, two cities in Middle Egypt. Uh, and those same routes were later used by the Romans and then tons of other civilizations to get stuff through. It was Hanu that paved the way for, I, I don't know, what's, what's it called? Some trade... Uh, Silk Road. Silk Road, thank you. God, I'm fucking idiot. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, this one is funny. Uh, it's the story of Julian Bayless. Uh, this guy was just looking on Google Earth, just looking at it. It was fun. You know, we like doing that. It's interesting to see what we can find. But he was looking at it, and he saw this area of green vegetation. And it was this area that was never explored before. So he got a crew together and went to go explore this. And it turns out that it was this completely new region of the Earth no one's ever even been to. Uh, you have, like, he found so many species. He found, like, 200 species of butterflies and he found uh, different kinds of uh, wildcats. It was, it was crazy. Or not wildcats, it was something else. Whatever. Animals. Animals, yes. <laughs> we'll just use animals. Alright. So, it's amazing how we thought that we explored the entire Earth. It, except for, you know, the inside, but whatever. It's amazing how we thought that, that we thought we had everything. But there's always another limit to push. There's always something we don't know, even about ourselves, especially about ourselves. So we have to keep going, we have to keep looking. Alright, so why do we explore the Mormon? Uh, for this, I have to talk about uh, Joseph Mengel. Do, you, uh, do any of you guys know who Joseph Mengel is? Nazi, Nazi doctor. Nazi doctor, there you go. So he did a lot of crazy experiments with, uh, especially twins who had two different color eyes. Uh, he did a lot of stuff with uh, bestiality. It was, it, was, it was pretty nasty, the stuff that he did. But the weird thing, the very weird thing about uh, Joseph Mengel, is to the children that he was using for experiments, he was like the nicest guy to them. Like he would give them snacks and food, like he would treat them like his own. And he, they would actually call him Uncle Mango. It was, it was really weird. So it doesn't make any sense. Why would this maniac also have this weird soft side to him? Uh, so it, it's interesting. It brings us to the concept of a moral explana uh, exploration. So we have to explore way more than just the physical and the conceptual. We have to explore something, I guess, deeper than that. Uh, so we go, and when it comes to moral exploration, we have a couple things. We have the Euthyphro Dilemma and the problem of, of evil. And the, the problem of evil, by the way, uh, has 
has an entire branch of theology dedicated to its refutation. Eight short sentences by Epicurus, an entire branch of theology. It's called theodicy. Uh, and the Euthyphro Dilemma, do you guys know what the Euthyphro Dilemma is? Alright, so basically, uh, so there's in, uh, I forgot, I think it was Socrates, it was in uh, his uh, epic uh, Euthyphro, his dialogue uh, Euthyphro. Uh, so he's posed with this uh, question, are good things good because God wills them, or does God will things because they are good? So either way, it poses a problem. Uh, in one, morals are fluid. They're almost arbitrary. In the other one, God cannot be the arbiter of them. Either way, what is good and where does it come from? Uh, that's the question that we have to always leave off with. That's what we're always talking about. Uh, next we have acceptance. Uh, so this one, this section was kind of the hardest for me to actually write down, so bear with me, because I'm still working on the book. I'm I, I just started the the actual chapter on acceptance, so I'm kind of shaky on this one. Uh, so gawking at morbidity is often about asking why. When, for example, something big happens in the news, like let's say that shooting in Charleston, uh, that was a pretty big thing, right? So when, when we hear about that, we have certain feelings about it. We can't stop that, we just have a certain feeling about it. Uh, we watch stuff like the news, or our friends talk about it, or friends give interviews about it, you know, if they were there or something. Uh, we do that, and we seek comfort in the fact that people think like we do. It's a very accepting feeling <laughs> when we gawk at morbidity, when, when we enjoy looking at this kind of stuff that's supposed to be terrifying. But in the end, it means that accepting death doesn't mean you won't be devastated when someone dies, but you can concentrate on your grief rather than why they had to die. Alright, so acceptance of God. Uh, so it's not only about acknowledging reality, it's about being content with it in a more strict definition of acceptance. Uh, when, so we all need to accept our mortality, that's true. Uh, it happens to all of us. We look around and we say, why? Why does this exist? What is the meaning of this? Uh, and the last point of Scream is obviously meaning, but that that's a little deeper, I guess. Uh, so we need to accept our mortality, and that's a very important part, but we don't like doing that kind of stuff. Uh, we like accepting a nicer, a softer feeling. So people say that there's a heaven or a hell or the reincarnation. Uh, maybe even a purgatory uh, seems pleasant, because we, we're not okay with a spark that doesn't burn forever, for some reason. People are afraid of that. People are afraid of the end. Uh, I mean, we are more logical people here. Some of us might be afraid of death, some of us might not be. Either way, we have to come to terms with our mortality. Uh, some people just choose the route of God. Alright, so mortality, of course it's comforting, I already went through that. We need a reason for mortality to exist. I don't know why I said morality. I meant mortality. Anyways. Alright, meaning? Okay, so our short lives, that's what I, I feel this is what gives us purpose. This is what gives us the drive to push forward and actually do something. If we had an infinite amount of time to do something, why on earth would we even bother? We'll just do it later. We'll procrastinate, like Chris. Hey, let's go. <laughs> All right. So, what does meaning have to do with God? Do I need to explain that? The answer is no, because people talk about this shit all the time. All right. So, in the end, we all love to scream. We all are morbidly curious because it gives us strength, catharsis, reality, exploration, acceptance, and meaning. And these are just some of the reasons people believe in God. There might be more. Obviously, there are probably more. Uh, but these are some other possible reasons why people believe in God. Because it gives them strength, catharsis, reality, exploration, acceptance, and meaning. Thank you.